Good evening. Uh, the book I want to discuss today is called Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency in Colonial India. Its author is Ranajit Guha, and the book was first published by Oxford University Press, New Delhi, 1983. Uh, this, this book is now viewed as a classic of Indian historiography. And I would go so far as to say that Ranjit Goa's masterful work, now four decades old, has had an influence far outside the field of Indian history and historiography. So Ranajit Guha is an Indian historian uh, who lived largely outside India. Uh, he lived in Britain and in Australia uh, for some time. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, I think at least for the last perhaps four, five decades, uh, lived in Vienna. Uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his work uh, spawned a new school of thought a new school of Indian historiography. It's called subaltern studies. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many uh, people who are listening to this talk, especially those who are scholars more widely and especially students of Indian history are of course familiar uh, with subaltern studies. Uh, but I think the familiarity with subaltern studies extends to people who do uh, work in anthropology, people who work in post-colonial theory, um, and uh, indeed, I would say, uh, several other fields. Now, Ranajit Goa uh, passed away earlier this year. He was just a few months, perhaps only a month, short of being 100 years old. And uh, his first book uh, is a book which he published back in the 19... Uh, 50s, as I seem to recall, it might have been or might have been perhaps around 1960. I don't have a recollection of it, though I know the book rather well. Uh, a rule of property for Bengal, a study of the permanent settlement in India, and uh, in Bengal, and and this is a reference to uh, fundamental transformations uh, in land ownership um, uh, under colonial rule under the. Under the, uh, under the governor generalship of Lord Cornwallis, Cornwallis uh, back in uh, the 1780s. I think the permanent settlement was around 1789. Um, however, I want to, uh, for the present purposes, uh, stay with this book, uh, which is, in my view, an extraordinary work, uh, which is not to say that it isn't uh, free of uh, some problems. Uh, I think that there are some fundamental conceptual issues here, uh, which uh, would require some more rethinking. Um, and uh, uh, even though I think that the book has not been subjected to what I would call a rigorous scru scholarly scrutiny, I think people have used it widely, but it seems to me that uh, the book itself has not really been subject to, uh, to as I said, a critical uh, a rigorous uh, a critical inquiry. Uh, th this book um, uh, uh, merits a kind of an investigation uh, which um, I think would make it actually uh, useful and productive and enlightening even for people who are not conversant with the subject matter of the book, right? So elementary aspects of peasant insurgency, we can think of it really as a, as a book on the grammar of um, uh, uh, peasant revolts uh, in India. Uh, the author uh, suggests that his uh, framework is uh, limited to a certain period of time, ending in, um, ending in uh, roughly about uh, uh, 1900. And, uh, uh, you know, he begins his narrative really uh, uh, around the 1780s. So it's really about 115 years of, uh, of India being under uh, colonial rule. Um, although it is not simply the colonial power uh, and the peasants uh, who are the only players here because uh, 
And the book is also about another major class of players, that is Indian landlords and Indian money lenders, zamindars, uh, and sahukars or mahajans. Uh, they are major players in this as well. Uh, and of course, there were many instances of revolt. Uh, there are many words used for revolt, jackeries, uh, hools, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, I'll just use the word revolt or rebellion. Uh, and um, many of these revolts or rebellions undertaken by peasants uh, were undertaken not only uh, against the colonial state or against the zamindar, often the two converged. Uh, so these revolts were against what we might describe as various centers of power. And in this particular grammar uh, of peasant descent, uh, Ranajit Gua suggests what are some of the modalities, the principal modalities uh, in which this peasant insurgency can be actually understood, right? So, the, so apart from the introduction and the epilogue, you have six chapters apart from those two, and those two chapters, those two, uh, those six, excuse me, those two six, uh, those six chapters in turn, then each of them is devoted to one of these, what he calls modalities uh, or registers uh, in which we can understand the nature and the scope of peasant rebellion in colonial India. Those six are negation, ambiguity, modality, solidarity, transmission, and territoriality. Uh, uh, I should add, perhaps I've already hinted this in a manner of speaking at the outset of my talk, but I should suggest that this book is really intended largely for scholars. For scholars, it has a very dense scholarly apparatus uh, and for serious students uh, of uh, history, of anthropology, um, more broadly of the social sciences. Uh, I don't think it's the kind of work that would at all interest economists, uh, given the very narrow worldview within which economists in particular operate and their propensity, of course, towards entirely mathematical kind of models for much of their work. I doubt that the traditional political scientists will also find anything particularly uh, interesting in this. But I think for anyone else engaged in thought, um, this book holds out a lot of promise, okay? Um, and uh, uh, I will not be able to, within the confines of this brief talk, given the nature of these talks, be able to discuss all of these six modalities at, at any length, but I want to give a few instances of how Ranajit Gua is thinking about uh, peasant insurgency and why he thinks the subject is of considerable importance, right? So um, the, uh, before I venture into uh, discussing some of the theoretical apparatus and the kind of works that he uses, and then moving on to a discussion of some of these modalities. Uh, or let's use another uh, word, as I've suggested before, uh, the grammar of descent. Uh, we can also think of uh, the type, uh, a kind of a typology of peasant rebellions. So there are different ways to think about uh, the kind of framework that we want to used to try to understand what he's doing here. But before we do that, do that um, I want to first begin with uh, simply a remark about the kinds of sources that he uses, and, uh, and in turn, what some of those problems are that arise from the kind of sources that he uses, right? Now, uh, 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 in going through the bibliography uh, and in going through the notes, it becomes apparent that that uh, uh, Ranajit Gua is uh, working with a number of different intellectual traditions. He is working in the first instance uh, with uh, what we might call the uh, kind of theoretical work that has emanated from, uh, from Europe uh, in the 20th century. So there is structuralism. There's a the work of Roland Barth, uh, Levi Strauss. Uh, there's a the work of uh, the kind of structuralists who really work with language. Uh, so someone like Saussure. Uh, there's also uh, the palpable influence of an American philosopher such as Charles Saunders Peirce, uh, who uh, worked on uh, signs and symbols. Um, and then we have, in addition to that, uh, we have 
uh, the work of a number of people working in the area of semiotics. So we can go back to Saussure as well, but we can go back to people like Jakobson and a number of people who are actually really quite obscure. I mean, there's something a little bit, a little bizarre almost in, uh, in some of the very obscure works that he has used. Uh, and as I'm going to suggest, uh, perhaps a suggestion that not everyone will agree with and a suggestion that might appear as a provocation almost. Um, there is something of the tendency in this work, um, notwithstanding the great admiration, as I said, that I have for it, uh, there is something of a tendency for the author to want to be a little bit um, um, flashy in his display of erudition, in his display of erudition. Then there is a work of Sanskrit grammarians uh, that he uses, uh, uh, going back, of course, uh, to uh, people like Panini, for example, right? And so here again, there, there's a rather odd combination of things that one sees at work here. Um, but one also sees uh, the influence of, obviously, of Gramsci, uh, which was apparent uh, in the uh, the whole project of subaltern studies, as uh, some of the listeners here are aware, there are uh, the, the you know the first six volumes of subaltern studies were edited by Ranajit Gu himself, um, and the the first three volumes of those came out around the time that uh, this book, Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency, came out. I think the first volume of subaltern studies was around 1982 or thereabouts. Um, uh, there were 12 volumes in all of subaltern studies, and uh, volumes 7 to 12 were edited by uh, 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 scholars who had been affiliated with the subaltern studies school, including former students uh, of Ranajit Gu and people who had sort of coalesced around him uh, in, uh, in Australia, especially, um, and Sussex. Um, um, and, and not all of them were by any stretch of the imagination um, a Bengali historian. There were certainly people like Depe Chakrabarti, uh, now a very eminent historian uh, in his own right, of course, uh, much like Partho Chatterjee. So Partho Chatterjee and uh, Depe uh, were uh, members of the collective right from the outset, um, uh, as were Shahed Amin, uh, David Arnold, David Hardiman, Shumit Sarkar, and a couple of others. Uh, but but I won't get into the history of that. What we are really doing here is we're really looking at the kinds of uh, the the kinds of sources that we can think of that Ranajit Gua um, uh, is uh, uh, you know um, uh, utilizing in in uh, his work. Uh, there is also finally um, uh, the archives, of course, of colonial India itself. Uh, we might say also wider works in European history, works on the French Revolution, works having to do with rumor, uh, and a wide swath of Marxist and neo-Marxist scholarship, right? So all of that really informs this work. Now, um, uh, one of the things that, that we find, so as I said, I, I, I had suggested that there may be a remark or two that may not go down well with uh, everyone, particularly with people who, who have felt close to Ranajit Gu and his work. But, um, you know, uh, you see, when you read this work, you see a kind of a predilection towards order and classification. Um, so when he talks about uh, negation, uh, 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 you know, in, in uh, elementary aspects, uh, then he discusses what he means by that. Then he will far parse it further into various categories. Um, and, and then you get subcategories, right? So when you talk about ne negation, one form of negation is discrimination, meaning here that uh, when peasants went on a rebellion, when they undertook to revolt, what they would do is they would attack or burn buildings associated with the zamindar or with the money lender or with the colonial state, their oppressors. But when they did so, they were very careful that if they burned down a building that didn't burn down the home of the workers or of the peasants, right? Of course, we see that even in 
ordinary instances, if I may put it this way, of course, Ranajit Gua might question whether we should even speak of ordinary instances, given the example I'm going to give of looting. So let's say you have a riot in a, in a place, um, uh, let's, say, let's say a place uh, like India, what happened in Gujarat in 2002, when we know that there was a pogrom against the Muslims and wide-scale looting of Muslim-owned shops. And we know with absolute certainty that when these shops were looted and the next shop, the adjacent shop on both sides were Hindu, they were spared. So the looters in fact had a list and they said, and they were told you go and burn this one down and this is Muslim owned, they're very particular. So they discriminated in Gua's sense of the term. And that's where we begin to see that there's a bit of a problem of a different kind, which I'll return to later on. But here I simply want to suggest that when he speaks of negation, he's saying one aspect of negation is discrimination. Then the other aspect of it is inversion, right? The world turned upside down. Here he's, here he's borrowing widely from the work of somebody like Mao, uh, his classic essay on a report on the conditions of the peasantry in Hunan province, 1927, where there's this marvelous passage where Mao says, ah, you know, when you go to these places, you find that on the one hand, you had these rich landlords and the elites who collaborated with them, government officials and so on. Whatever they thought was terrible. So they would report about some insurgency and they would say, oh, this is terrible. Whatever they thought was terrible, Mao says, is actually fine. It's terrible. It's fine. That's, that's the inversion. Right? And then Guha tells you that, ah, but there are two types of inversion. There's the ritual inversion. Right? The ritual inversion is, in many cultures, for example, there's one day of the year when the oppressed the people who are living at the margins, the people who are poor, working class peasants, Dalits in India, that one day they become the overlords. Right? They become the overlords and the overlords become the subalterns. The positions are reversed, the hierarchy is reversed. But the next day, the peasant who could gleefully, as it were, you know, dominate over the zamindar for one day, for example, what happens on the day of Holi. The next day, the peasant or the worker has to go back to the field and become the submissive person that he's supposed to be for the remaining 364 days of the year, right? That's a ritualistic inversion, something that Bhaktin uh, uh, wrote about quite voluminously especially as I seem to recall on his book on Rabelais and his world, again published um, several decades ago. Right? And then there's, so that's a ritualistic inversion as opposed to the kind of inversion that Mao is talking about when he says, it's terrible, it's fine. Right? But then even then when he speaks about the inversion and he talks about the destruction, then, he, uh, then again, Ranajit will give you a further classification. There's arson, there's looting, there's, you know, there's this and that, right? Uh, there's, th there's deliberate uh, theft, which we can't really call theft from his point of view, and so on. And this predilection for order and classification reminds me very much of the Sanskritic tradition. Right? There's something almost Brahminical about Professor Guha something Brahminical about the way in which he writes about peasant insurgency. And this predilection, as I said, for text, for the textual tradition, you know, um, and given, of course, that the whole body of his work, including the subaltern studies volumes and, and especially this book as well, um, perhaps less so a rule of property in many ways because it's a different kind of work. It's an intellectual history of the ideas that led to the creation of the permanent settlement and the role of the physiocrats. Uh, so the tenor of that work was somewhat different. But if you look at the rest of the body of his work, uh, Gua has all along been 
obsessed with what he calls elitist historiography, which he further then describes, parses into colonial elitist and nationalist elitist historiography. And he then purports to offer the most resounding critique of such historiography. But there is nevertheless, it seems to me, something Brahminical in the way in which he thinks about some of these things. So now um, I've given an instance of one of these um, modalities, uh, negation, and how uh, Gua thinks about it. And let me dwell on this a little bit further, because this is where I think his work uh, offers also a kind of empirical richness. But it's the kind of empirical richness which suggests how an author must, in fact, not simply resort to a create to an ex archive that exists, but actually carves out an archive of his own. Right. So when he is discussing uh, this negation, uh, he discusses the role. And here we can think about semiotics, we can think about, about, and he has a very dense philosophical discussion, which I can't get into here because it's really the proper forum for that is really a, a, you know, a long written work on him or perhaps a much more formal scholarly paper uh, rather than these kind of informal uh, book talks that I'm doing uh, of which this is an instance. Uh, but he has, a, he has a dense philosophical discussion of the difference between a sign as an, and an index and a symbol. Um, it's not really necessary to get into that. We can think of it the following way, that in this chapter on negation, he has a very arresting discussion of umbrellas. How do they work, right, in relationship to the idiom of power? The mustache, shoes. And just to give an illustration of what he means here, or to elaborate further upon what he means by all of this, we can think of it this way, that if you go to the Hindi film of the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, up to the 80s, after, uh, once you get into the 90s, you begin to see fewer films really where the village is the site of the film. Um, and, and certainly in those decades, particularly films of the 50s and 60s, there were lots of films set in the Indian village. There was always one person in the village, the headman, who could actually flaunt his umbrella, right? Flaunt his umbrella. You see this in later films too, by the way. You know, it was the headman or the rich landlord, the zamindar, and it was usually a long, big, black umbrella. Uh, you see the film by Mani Ratnam called Bombay. This film is actually 1992, and where, where this is still transparent, right? where the where the uh, the father uh, of the Hindu boy who falls in love with a Muslim girl. I mean, he is he is the custodian of the temple, the most esteemed man in the village. Uh, you know, when he walks out, he, he flaunts his umbrella, and he's the only one who's carrying the umbrella. So who has a discussion of that? Because of course, one of the ways in which you negate this is you appropriate that symbol of authority, right? You defy it in other ways. Let's take the instance of shoes. And I think this is very common in Indian households even today, where you have domestic servants. Domestic servants do not appear before the owners of the, their home with shoes. And it would not suffice to say that traditionally many people uh, even visitors and even people who belong to the elite class that when they come to a person's home, they take off their shoes outside. And nowadays, it's not commonly done in many homes and hasn't been done for some decades. But what is still very common is when a person comes to your home, you're a, you have a middle class home, they're coming from outside, let's say the plumber, the electrician, uh, somebody who's cleaning, cleaning the drains, and of course, the domestic workers, they all take their shoes off outside, right? Shoes could not be worn in the presence of those who were superior to you. And, and the, the peasant who wanted to, to negate the authority or the worker who wanted to negate the authority of the landlord right? or, or, the, or whoever they lead might be, they would appear in the presence of that person with their shoes. Right? And there was, of course, the mustache. And here you see, again, now you go to another film, for example, uh, uh, not, not a popular Hindi film really as such. Um, uh, it's a film that often is uh, viewed as being more uh, 
uh, in the realm of what is called art cinema in India. But in fact, it's a film that sits somewhere in between a wonderful film by Ketan Mehta called Mirch Masala, you know, where, where you have this person who is really uh, like, in a way, the colonial landlord, you know, overlord. And he's got a nice big mustache and he keeps on twirling it. And the mustache, you know, somebody would say is phallic here almost. Uh, it's really a symbol of his muscular and singular authority. Right? So this is, this is that discussion around negations, the use of symbols. Now, just to, let's take another instance of a very different kind of modality to understand um, uh, uh, you know, what uh, Gua is really speaking about here, what he's really adverting to here. And, and the instance that I want to take here is um, what he speaks of as territoriality, right? So one of the things that he discusses, uh, uh, there was a, uh, there's a blog that, uh, that, uh, that um, uh, Manan Ahmed uh, started many years ago called Chapati Mystery. Uh, a very fine blog. Um, and this word chapati is the word that is critical uh, in the instance that I want to furnish here of uh, what Ranajit Gua talks about as territoriality. Now, when he speaks about territoriality, he, what he wants to suggest here is that we have to think about how a rebellion spread, okay? How it spread. What was the territory that it encompassed? And he says that one of the, and, and how were messages conveyed to people whom you wanted to lure into the rebellion? Right? Chapatis in 1857, 1858. Chapatis were circulated, they were sent. Right? They, were, they were sent from one person to another. They were passed around like you might pass around a baton in a relay race, except that this was over a, an expanse of territory that could be dozens of kilometers, right? Dozens of kilometers from some point. And these chapatis were passed, and colonial officials caught on to something happening. They weren't quite sure. They weren't quite sure how to interpret these chapatis. It's really a fascinating discussion. And, I, and this is what I mean when I said that the work has a certain kind of empirical richness. But this then brings me to the final set of considerations, which would be of the greatest interest, particularly to scholars um, and students thinking about this book. And that is that what exactly are the larger ideas that Gua wants to convey? What he's trying to convey here is the following set of issues. One is, a, one is a set of issues having to do with what, in a separate essay published in volume two of subordinate studies, he called the pros of counterinsurgency. The problem for the historian who wants to study, let's say, a rebellion. Okay, it could be something as big as the 1857 and 58 rebellion. It could be, it could be uh, a relatively smaller revolt of the kind. Uh, of the kind that he discusses. It could be a revolt of which was uh, of the magnitude of the Santal Rebellion, right? The problem for the historian who wants to do this is that the vast bulk of the sources come not from the rebels or the insurgents. They come from those colonial officials and their collaborators who put down that rebellion, any particular rebellion. So let's say, let's say that um, you want to know what the rebels thought during the Santal rebellions. The Santal rebels didn't write anything down, right? 1857 and 58, now we still, we, at least we have a few diaries uh, written by the, by the sepoys, as they were called, uh, or by other Indians as well. Um, th these also largely have become known to us only over the course of the last two, three decades. When he was writing, even that much was not known. There were very few, res very few sources. Although, of course, there had been archival collections, um, uh, such as a number of volumes published by the government of Uttar Pradesh, 
uh, on the freedom struggle. But if you look at that archive, so to speak, those multi-volume sets, the vast majority of the documents published there were, in fact, documents which were written by colonial officials, uh, police officers, right? by the counterinsurgents. Now, he is suggesting that in order to understand the voice of the rebel, to recover that voice, we may have to go to these very documents which are suppressing these rebels. But he's saying that sometimes there's direct speech. That would be the simplest instance of where we could read a document written by a colonial official whose task was to suppress the rebellion. And so he might write in a particular document that he overheard such and such conversation taking place between the, the captured rebels, for example. So that becomes, quote, direct speech. That's the voice of the rebel in a manner of speaking, it's still being mediated, right? But he says that there are intellectual strategies for reading these documents to see how they betray themselves, reading these documents for their gaps, for their fissures, for their betrayals, right? And this is where, where he feels that he has to deploy some of the intellectual apparatus of people um, working in post-structuralism and semiotics and especially deconstruction. Right? That's one set of issues. And of course, we have to ask whether indeed he's able to really do that successfully or not. Right? The second is, and, and as an instance of how successful he is, you have to go to a, something like the documents which show, where, for example, what colonial officials interpreted from a native appearing with shoes before that colonial official. Right? That gives an instance of how the colonial official might have recorded in a document, these natives had the temerity to appear before us, right? before a colonial official, before the zamindar who filed a complaint, had the temerity to appear in their shoes. That would be an illustration of where then you would have to understand that even though this document is produced by the colonial official, it tells us something about the consciousness of the rebel. And that brings us to the second theoretical and final point that I want to really make. This is a book which is really about not just the semiotics of peasant insurgency, it's a book about the consciousness of the rebel. How does one really get to the consciousness of this rebel? Because this fundamental argument where he's really drawing upon the work of someone like, let's say, Gramsci. Gramsci has had elucidated uh, uh, an argument about what he called the two consciousnesses. Uh, this is in his prison notebooks. Uh, or we can think of it as one contradictory consciousness such that a subaltern group right, has an inadequate conception of the world, but has nonetheless adopted a conception which is not his own. He has this consciousness, but he has nonetheless adopted a consciousness which is contradictory. Why? Because this conception of the world right, is borrowing from the elite. It's borrowed from another group. But nevertheless, what he's saying is, it is not entirely dependent on that, right? It's not entirely dependent on that. There is a realm of autonomy that the peasant is able to carve out. So we can think of this fractured consciousness. And here I'm going to simply quote, he theorizes insurgency on page 11 of this book. Okay, page 11 of this book, he theorizes this consciousness, this insurgency, okay, as a site where the two mutually contradictory tendencies within this still imperfect, almost embryonic, theoretical consciousness met for a decisive trial of strength. Now, let me reread it because I deleted uh, a portion between the M dashes. So now let me reread that sentence. Insurgency was indeed the site where the two mutually contradictory tendencies, okay, 
within the still imperfect, almost embryonic theoretical consciousness, that is a conservative tendency made up of the inherited and uncritically absorbed material of the ruling culture and a radical one oriented towards a practical transformation of the rebels' conditions of existence met for a decisive trial of strength. Right? He's saying that you cannot write the history of insurgency merely as a history of events without a subject. The subject was the rebel. The rebel's consciousness is fractured. It's fractured because he has to some extent adopted the worldview of the ruling elites, the very people that he is attempting to defy. To some extent, he's not been able to abandon that completely. Over a period of time, he had become more astute in being able to abandon it. And to some extent, he is embracing, right, this a radical consciousness, which, to quote Gua once again, is oriented towards a practical transformation of the rebel's conscious, rebel's conditions of existence, where he's increasingly becoming aware, becoming increasingly aware of the conditions of his subordinacy. And this awareness in turn is now leading him increasingly to exercise his own agency, right? Um, I don't really want to use the word agency because it's almost become part, part of pop culture, but, but I think it helps to illustrate the nature of the argument that he's making. The fundamental theoretical question that still remains here is that what he would really like to do is he would like to think of this peasant consciousness and then, by extension, the consciousness of, the, of all subaltern classes whoever they may be, including workers, he would like to think of this as constituting an autonomous domain, as not really shaped by the consciousness of the elite. Is there such a thing as an autonomous domain here, really, that one can think about? That would require another whole set of reflections because then we would need to really get into a series of talks which would have to do with the theory of freedom and liberation. My intent of here, of course, has been to really discuss this book, which, as I've said, I have some difficulties with, uh, and I can parse some particular sentences at very great length, which are very troubling in some ways. But I think on the whole, this is a tremendous intellectual achievement. And I commend this book to everyone's attention.